Thanks, Jesse. Uh, so thank you all very much for welcoming me back. Actually, just slight correction, I was here before this was called Thunder Plains. I actually spoke at Red Dirt JS even years before that. So I don't know who here uh, maybe was part of Red Dirt before, but uh, I am so thrilled to see such a fantastic community and the conferences that have spun up around the community. I am originally from Oklahoma City. I was born and raised here, attended the University of Oklahoma for several years, uh, right as the dot-com bus was happening, and I left town because there wasn't much of a tech industry, and I went to Austin, which is where I now reside. Uh, but it's such a thrill to come back each, each year and see the blossoming, the growth that's happening here. So it's a, it's a fantastic honor, and I appreciate that very much. Uh, I think we're still working out some of our slide issues, so. I'm filling uh, for just a moment while they work that out. So um, let me just say before we even get into the talk that it has been an absolutely, I've been watching the, the Twitter feed and other social media and back channels, hearing people talking in the halls. What a fantastic conference this has been and it's only getting better and better every single year. This reputation of this conference precedes itself and people talk about, I've literally been in other countries on the other side of the world and, and heard somebody mention Thunderplanes before. It's a fantastic conference. So let's give it up for the organizers, all the tech people. <laughs> Truly an honor to be here. Are we still? Uh... All right, well, I don't know if it's me walking around or touching things, but hopefully they, they can be uh, working on that in the background. So um, before we uh, get into this, there's a little bit of setup that I need to give you for this talk. So uh, you see the zero out of 350 up at the top, and that may scare you to think that I'm about to go through 350 slides. <laughs> and that's totally true. We'll be here for maybe three hours, maybe a little less. Actually, it's not true at all. What on earth is it that you are seeing here? What is this? Well, this is um, because it's a closing keynote and because we've had this fantastic conference experience, I chose to be a little bit risky. There are no slides yet. Every slide is going to be produced live. So in a way, we're all going to discover this talk together. I am going to type the slides and pull the slides out from uh, preset content. We're gonna discover this slide, the slides together and in fact, the talk. So that's what you can expect from this talk. I'm going to be talking about uh, some things. This is not a tech talk, although there will be a couple of very, very tiny snippets of code. This is very much not a tech talk, which is, to be honest with you, a little bit outside of my comfort zone. I normally give those deep tech talks, but I also have some aspirations that are higher, a bar higher for our industry and for our community. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to give this talk. Uh, just a little bit of a backstory. Those, some of you may have seen before that there was going to be a different talk in this slot until about a week and a half, maybe two weeks ago at the most. And um, I learned that one of the easiest ways to give your conference organizers a complete heart attack is to message them the few minutes before their deadline and to say, I want to change my entire talk, especially if you are a keynoter. So I did that. And then I gave them an even further heart attack when I showed up today and said, yeah, I don't have any slides. So it was fantastic. They just kind of rolled with the punches. Uh, but we're going to have fun with this. So uh, before I get to the meat of the talk, every time I'm given an opportunity, a stage to speak to people, uh, this is something that's very important and very close to my heart. And I hope that this is taken in the spirit that it's given. But I want to talk to you about privilege awareness for just a moment. I look out across the crowd, and I do see uh, lots of different kinds of faces. I see different skin colors and genders and persuasions. I do see differences in the crowd, and I am encouraged by that, but I'm also discouraged because, to be quite blunt and frank, I see an awful lot of people that might look like me in the mirror. And I don't really consider that to be acceptable in our industry. I don't consider it to be acceptable that we have just this silent elephant in the room that we have not talked enough about. And those that do talk about it get labeled as radicals. They get labeled as crazy people that don't have some kind of sense of what's going on. And I totally reject that particular narrative. So what I'm going to do in just the next few moments is to declare, declare to you what I call my own privilege awareness. This is simply an introspection on myself and on my particular story, how I got to this particular stage. And it should not be taken as me saying this is your privilege, even if you look like me, this is not your privilege. Your privilege is individual and unique to you. 
But it should be taken as a challenge to ask yourself, what are my privileges? I do not have any solutions to the problems of inclusion that our industry faces. They are problems. And I'll argue to the death to, to convince you that they really are problems. But I don't have any solutions to those, but I do know that not talking about it is not a solution. So I'm simply trying to start a conversation about it. So very briefly, I would say, most obviously, I'm white. I didn't struggle with anybody second guessing me because of my skin color. I'm male, and that's quite obvious that I didn't have to ever worry that somebody would second guess the work that I was producing and say, well, did somebody have to help you figure that out? I have a son and a daughter, and I aspire for both of them to come up into an industry where they are given equal, completely equal treatment. They are both assumed to be as smart and as capable as they possibly can be, and it has absolutely nothing to do with their gender. I'm also educated, and I consider that to be a privilege, because not everybody had the expectation and the support from their family to assume that they would do some sort of schooling past high school. And I had that. Again, I said I grew up here. And I grew up with the expectation that my family would support me going to school, and I did. And that is definitely a privilege of my part. I'm also heterosexual, and thankfully, this is becoming less and less of a privilege. I am, I am encouraged to see that our industry is getting more and more to the point where this doesn't matter. But I know that I grew up, and I know that I grew up right here in the middle of Oklahoma, in a place where there were people that were fearful for their life if they came out and said who they are. And that is unacceptable. It's unacceptable in Oklahoma. It's unacceptable on the other side of the world. I also consider this, and especially since I get an opportunity to speak in many places, I consider the fact that I grew up in a country that never second-guessed what my rights were. They never, I never had to worry that if I said something, I might have my entire job taken away from me. These are privileges that got me to where I'm at. And those that get to the same point might very well have had to work much harder to get to this same point. And I want us all to take as a challenge to ask ourselves to look to your left and to your right, both physically and metaphorically, to look to your left and your right and ask yourself, what are my privileges? And how can I be more empathetic of the people around me? That is the frame for which we will discuss the rest of today. So, oh, I, I should have mentioned that I'm also employed. That's probably, uh, that seems like a small point, but I haven't had to struggle the way some people have. So privilege awareness. All right, now, uh, my name is Kyle Simpson. I'm known as Getify Online, so those of you that would like to reach out and provide some sort of feedback, tell me that I'm crazy about the things that I tell you today, I would love for you to do that, and there's plenty of ways to get a hold of me online, so I'm Getify pretty much everywhere that would matter. I have written a series of books, as was mentioned. It's called You Don't Know JS. The entire six book, 1100 page series is available for free online up on the GitHub repo. You don't know JS.com will redirect to that. So I would encourage you to check out those books. If you find any of that useful, of course, I appreciate those that want to purchase copies. They've been published through O'Reilly. I am the head of curriculum for MakerSquare, which is a developer, engineer, developer and engineering training school. We have office, campuses in Austin, Texas, San Francisco, and Los Angeles. I took this post in July of this year, and I'm managing all of the JavaScript curriculum around um, our training across our campuses, as well as corporate training. I would love to chat with you, any of you if you have any questions about developer schools, or if you've heard different things and you're curious about it or you want to provide some feedback, I'd love to chat with you about that. If you or somebody that you know is trying to get more into development and would be interested in ways that we could help you, or if your team at your company would be interested in ways that we could help, please reach out. All right. So to, tonight I'm going to talk to you about the economy of keystrokes. And I know that sounds a bit strange. Let me try to set up some context for that. Uh, this is a very famous Shakespeare quote. All the world's a stage, and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances. Now, before I make the, the bigger point that I want to make about this quote, or the display of this quote, I just want to say that when I, when I came across this Shakespeare quote earlier while preparing, I was, I was sort of profoundly struck because it resonates at a deeper level to me than just what is perhaps being said in its English words. It resonates with me to think back and to reflect back, as I was just saying, upon where I have gotten to in my career, and to reflect back on the fact that my career is not a permanent establishment, that the place that I hold within our community and the voice, what little it may be, the voice that I have is not a permanent voice. And I think a lot of us try very hard to, or some of us anyway, have that aspiration to try to create something permanent, something that will change the landscape forever. 
And I've been personally dealing with, and I've even talked about this in previous conferences here at Thunder Plains, but I personally have been dealing with that question of, do I have to make some sort of lasting impact, or is it enough to make a big impact for right now? And so I saw this quote, and it was very profound to me to, to sort of bring up some of those same questions. But here's the uh, bigger point that will set up what, our, what we're going to talk about tonight. I'm going to rearrange, or not rearrange, but reformat this statement. And what I've done now is simply to remove most of the vowels except those that appear at the beginning and end of a word, and I've removed all the punctuation, and I've lowercased everything. Now, those of you reading this quote will probably observe that you can pretty much tell exactly what the quote was coming across, for the most part. Especially having seen it before, now looking at this particular quote formatted that way, yeah, it's still kind of go, all the world's a stage and all the men and women. Now, there's some, certainly some ambiguity here, but most of us probably get the point. So what I'm pointing out here is that there is some unnecessary characters in Shakespeare's wording. In fact, in all of literature, there are unnecessary characters that have been displayed. And if we went about the exercise of trying to remove those extra characters, or in a sense to remove those extra unnecessary keystrokes, we can arrive at something that is much shorter, much more terse. Some would say even more beautiful because it's not cluttered with all the commas and semicolons and other things that might have been seen before. But what I want to pose to you, and this is the question that should resonate with you for the rest of my comments tonight, what I want to pose to you is, while this does accomplish the same goal, it gets across some of that communication, is this form of communication as effective as Shakespeare's original language? You see, we oftentimes as developers do seek after the shortest possible way to express something. That probably does sound familiar to many of you. We as developers are kind of uniquely keen to trying to find the shortest possible way with the fewest number of keystrokes to accomplish some goal. I'm not entirely sure that that is our best path forward. So before we talk about code, I want to talk about some brief things, like, for example, the economy. Now, I am not an economist. Some of you here may know a whole lot more about the economy than I do. So feel free to take this metaphor and use it only so far as it's useful to you, and then discard it because it is just a metaphor. And if it stretches beyond uh, what is credible, then don't try to stretch it any further. But I do want to talk about some forces, some things that are at play within the economy and try to relate them back to those same types of forces that are at play within our code. So in the economy, of course, one of the things that we need in an economy is something to trade, something to move around. So we can have currency within an economy. Now, if I shorten that, we all still get the point. That's the currency. Uh, something people like to call it money. So let's use money. That seems a little bit more straightforward. Money is a thing that we trade to get stuff that we want, and you all know that. So there are things that we use within an economy, things that trade places, both services and products that we get for them, but the thing that moves the economy forward, the thing that is traded around is money. And that money can be, that currency can be physical, as in physical dollar bills and physical coins that we trade, but it can also be digital. And we see the rise of digital currencies like Bitcoin and the fact that banks basically don't have an awful lot of money anymore. They just have a big computer system that says money exists. We sort of invent money out of thin air at this point. So currency has become more digital than perhaps some of us would be comfortable with. I kind of harken back to, to some perspectives of the gold standard where money was physically attached to something that was there. Money is not so much attached to that, but what, whether it's digital or whether it's physical, whether it's a thing that you trade or whether it's just simply a number that changes on a spreadsheet, there's a trading of this money that drives this economy. Now, what do we do with that money? Well, clearly and obviously, we buy and sell things. I like the shortening of buy and sell. That still, I guess, kind of gets the point across, right? We like to buy and sell things within this economy. We're buying food, we're buying PS4s, we're buying the new iPhone 6s and 7s, we're buying a new MacBook Air, we're buying all of these things with our money. And we're also selling things. Some of you probably sell your services as a contractor. People pay you for your time, you're selling your time. So we trade money and we get something in return. There's also, within an economy, notions within finance, uh, in, a, in a bigger sense, within an economy, there's notion of both saving and investing. Saving and investing. Well, of course, 
Saving is holding on to my stuff, putting it into a bank account, holding on to it for a rainy day. And investing is putting it in somebody else's bank account, hoping that, that I will get some sort of return on that. I'll get some sort of interest given back to me. So we are trading things for future money that may come back to us. These are all notions, again, that I'm laying down as basic metaphors for us to discuss as we go forward. So saving and investing, think about that. We also have inflation. Inflation and deflation, of course. If you're not familiar with those terms, again, I'm not an economist, so I won't spend a lot of time talking about it, but if you're not familiar, essentially the notion of inflation is that over time, my dollar that's sitting in my wallet buys me less. And deflation says over time that my dollar buys me more. So we can think about these forces that are at work that take something that we physically had and can change what we can get for it. And before I go on, I just want to note that I have up at the top there, you'll notice that I'm almost at the limit of my character keystrokes that I can type. And it's giving me the warning. It says I'm at 346 out of 350. So we're about to find out here in just a moment what happens if I run out of keystrokes. Uh, but I'll keep going. So inflation, deflation. We also have notions of things like the GDP, the gross domestic product. That could be related to the total amount of keystrokes, the total amount of code that we produce as developers across our industry, for example. So GDP. We could also even think about things like our, uh-oh, I've run out of keystrokes. <laughs> And now every single keystroke that I make for the rest of this, we're going to get. No, actually, because I can just cheat. Just like we can cheat with real economies, I can cheat and just simply change my budget. <laughs> so hopefully, we'll see by the end. I, depending on how many mistakes I make, we'll see whether or not 1,200 is enough characters for my budget. But budgets within personal finance are a way for us to restrain the economy and our expression within the economy. We say, well, I may have $1,000 in my bank account, but my budget says I'm only going to spend 100 of that this month and save 900 of it. So budgets are a way for us to control and constrain. So those are our basic metaphors for what we're discussing. Now let's try to relate that to something a little bit more useful, a little bit more interesting to developers. So I want to talk about keystrokes, OK? Much like the keystrokes that I'm giving you right now, that I'm actually physically typing into these slides and we're seeing this talk unfold, I'm seeing it for the first time as well. I wanna talk about these keystrokes. The things that we use as developers are like currency. They are a currency within an economy. We choose to spend a keystroke or to save a keystroke. And when we spend a keystroke, we may be buying something for it. So you might ask, what might I be buying when I as a developer type a keystroke into my program? What might I be buying? Well, one of the obvious things is that I might be buying some actual functionality. I may choose to expend a certain amount of keystrokes and get some functionality as a result. That's the most obvious of the things that we purchase. But I'm also going to suggest that that's perhaps the least interesting of the things that we're purchasing with our keystrokes. So another thing that we might think about purchasing, which perhaps gives us a more interesting spin on the topic, is that we are also purchasing readability. We're choosing to expend or to save a keystroke in an effort, at least some of us anyway, in an effort to create more readable code. Now, when I say this, most of you will probably reflect upon this as well. You've probably heard before that we've been given certain features, for example, things that have been added to the languages of ES6. We've been given certain features that give us shorthand ways of expressing the same functionality. And it is suggested that that makes our code more readable. If we have to type less and we have to read less, then therefore our code is more readable. I like how readability, that totally gets the point across, right? I like how that shortens. <laughs> so readability, that should be an important thing that we would care about. Now, I want to talk just a moment. This talk is not going to be all about bashing on various different ES6 features. I'm actually a big fan of ES6. There's an awful lot of really good stuff in it. I want to talk about a couple of things as illustration points. So one of those very common things that is cited as a way to improve the readability of our code is the arrow function. So if I start out with the normal function, like we see here, and look, I just cheated. I only had to pay one keystroke for that because I just copied and pasted some code from Stack Overflow. <laughs> I didn't have to type anything, right? So I'm cheating here just a moment. But here's my normal function expressed as a function expression. And of course, it takes in the value y, and it multiplies it by 2, and it gives it back to me. So it is suggested that this code has 
a lack of readability because the word function is so long and so hard to type and the word return is so long and so hard to type and the shorter our functions, the more painful that particular problem becomes such that that became the, the impetus for a whole new feature or at least supposedly became an impetus for a whole new feature, a whole new operator being added to the language. Some of you have probably seen the arrow, the fat arrow as it's often called from coffee script days, the fat arrow is a way to express a function in a, what is seemingly a much more terse fashion that accomplishes the same goal. Now this happens to be the happy path for arrow functions. And this is also probably the only way you've ever seen these things illustrated. Because every one of my peers that gets up and talks at JavaScript conferences about how amazing ES6 is, we choose the happy path to illustrate. Because there are some ugly bits, but certainly that's not going to get the point across. So I'm going to choose the happy path, the happy path where there's only one line in my function, and I want to return that expression, and there's only one named parameter with no complication, and bam, I get this really simple expression. Turns out it's actually quite a bit more complex if you get into all the corner cases of these arrow functions, but let's not even talk about that. Let's just ask this notion of readability. Is this truly and genuinely more readable? Many people would vehemently say yes. And I'm calling that into question a little bit. Because the notion of readability is often cited as a very subjective notion. It's more readable to me. I like it better. It's easier for me to type, therefore it's better. But is that really the standard by which we should be judging? Because everyone in this room, if I polled every single person in this room, I'd get the number of people in this room plus one different opinions on what makes readability. I'd get lots of different opinions. Is there any, subject to, is there any objectivity to what is traditionally seen as a very subjective sort of thing? Well, it turns out there is actually, there has actually been some study, some formal academic study on the notion of readability. Some researchers set out to try to come up with an automated metric for code readability. That is that you could pump any gen generic piece of code from a language into this engine, and it could give you a metric that it spits out to tell you how readable that code is. The first time I heard that, I said, that's crazy. There's no possible way they could do that. Maybe Mechanical Turk, but it's certainly not going to be actually automated that a computer can tell me that. Last I checked, we haven't invented that level of artificial intelligence. But they studied this. They studied it and they asked, is there some sort of objective way to study it? And they did so with large numbers of humans that they were having come in and rate different pieces of code based upon their readability. And one of the interesting conclusions from this paper that I read is that they, they said one of the most important things that factors into readability is familiarity. This notion that if they were already familiar with the syntax or the idioms being used, when they saw a snippet of code, they immediately recognized those patterns and idioms and said that code's more readable. But if you showed them a piece of code that they were not familiar with, even if it had the exact same type of syntax, the exact same type of shortcuts, the familiarity hurt their readability. The lack of familiarity hurt the readability. So actually, maybe it's not just about familiarity. Maybe there's this notion of tribal knowledge that we have as developers. That if you're already very used to a piece of code and very used to a particular way of expressing certain idioms in your code, maybe you have a, a very good style guide defined for your program. Developers that have been immersed within that tribal knowledge will be able to make very effective use of that pattern and repeat it over and over and over again. And they'll even be able to read somebody else's code that did the same thing, and they will call that more readable. But is it objectively more readable? Is it really more readable? You see, as a teacher, my perspective is bigger than just optimizing for somebody that's already read the code once, or twice, or a hundred times. I'm a bit more interested in how easy is it for somebody to read that code and understand what it says that's never seen the code before that's never sat in one of your team meetings, that's never gone through dozens of code reviews on your project, can they look at your code and have any clue whatsoever what's happening? You see, that's more my definition of readability, is that there's something about trying to get away from this reliance or over-reliance, I guess I would say, on tribal knowledge. We're starting to get an interesting little word cloud being built here. All right, so. If we're not buying and selling readability necessarily, then what is a bigger thing that we might be buying and selling within the economy of keystrokes? 
And I would suggest that maybe it's that we're buying and selling ideas. This may stretch some of your brains a little bit, but I want to suggest to you a couple of observations that can be made, and they're made by people much smarter than me, so this is not original to me. The first thing that I can suggest or that I can observe is that there are an infinite number of computer programs, representations of source code that can be produced that will end result in the exact same sequence of ones and zeros to instruct the computer what to do. And I don't mean an infinite number of computer languages. We can say that there's an infinite number of JavaScript programs that will produce the exact same sequence of ones and zeros. Infinite, it's a big number. So if there's an infinite number of possible ways for us to express the source code, what possible choice, what possible metric might we use to choose how to pick the right one or the right set of representations? Another observation that can be made, and this one is frankly a little bit more difficult. I've had to come to terms with this more over time. This is more difficult for me to come to terms with. But it turns out that the more you study at these higher generations, we're in fourth generation languages as they go with JavaScript. And in fourth generation languages, we start to see a pretty big separation between the code that you write and the actual physical instructions happening on the computer. There's very little difference between assembly and the underlying instructions. There's a little bit more difference between C and the physical machine instructions. There's a giant difference between what we write in JavaScript and what actually happens on the computer. In fact, the JavaScript engine is picking up on clues and ideas and techniques that have been around since the 50s and the 60s, since the beginning, the genesis of computer programming languages. They look at the code, they perform analysis on the code, and they say, I get what you're trying to do. I see that you're trying to do a loop here. But I, being the engine, believe that there's a much better way of doing that. So I'm not going to use a loop at all. So we have to actually come to terms with the fact that even though my, my instinct is to be more of a craftsman about my code, to care much more deeply about exactly how I write my code, but it turns out that our code is really just nothing more than a suggestion to the computer of what it ought to think about doing. So if I put those two observations together, if I say that there's an infinite number of programs that could get the same end correct result and the JavaScript engine is going to take any number of those as just suggestions and then do whatever it wants to do anyway, how do we decide which JavaScript program to write? How do we decide which keystrokes to spend and how to spend them? And what I would say is we have to come to terms with the idea that code is first and foremost a means of communication, and only secondarily in a far second is it a set of instructions to the computer. Our source code is communication. It is communication with ourselves, with our other developers, and most importantly, I think, with our future selves. I don't know how many of you would feel the same as I do, but I've gone back to code that I wrote like two days ago and been like, what were you thinking? let alone weeks or months or years later going back and looking at code. I wish in those instances that I had paid more attention to the value of communicating through my code. Now, I'm going to take a little bit of a risk here and invoke someone because I think they had one tiny little snippet of usefulness in a whole cloud of crap. Um, so some of you may know this guy. And I know I'm taking a risk here because some of you are going to think that I'm endorsing him just simply because I put his picture in here. This is uh, the creator and maintainer of Linux, and this is Linus Torvalds. I don't, I don't even know if I pronounced his name correctly, but uh, he's a class A asshole. Like, just flat out <laughs> class A asshole. So take that. When I quote him, just know that I'm only quoting a very small portion. I'm not endorsing the way that he treats people is completely unacceptable. It is not what we aspire to. It is not even remotely the inclusive, the inclusive nature that I tried to set out at the beginning. But I, very recently, within the last couple of days, there was a post that came about, and he was on one of his very common rants about some code that somebody had submitted. And I don't know C that well, so I don't really know much of the details. But I just want to pull out a quote in, within the context of this larger 
rant. It says the code could easily have been done with just a single and understandable conditional, and the com compiler would have actually generated better code, and the code would look better and more understandable. Let me help him out just a little bit. Do you think, how do you think he would react if I chose to submit a pull request back to his rant and say, you should have written it shorter like this? There's a bunch of unnecessary stuff in there. The code could have easily been done with just a single and understandable conditional, and the compiler would have actually generated better code, and the code would have looked better and been more understandable. Well, actually, there's some, there's some interesting truth there. I don't like the guy that's saying it, and I don't like a lot of what he says, but there's some interesting truth there. And he follows on to say this. He follows on in that same rant to say, I want to make it clear to everybody that code like this is completely unacceptable. And that I resonate with. I want to make it clear that communication like this, while fun and interesting and golfing for the purposes of Twitter, is completely unacceptable. It just is. If our goal is to communicate with our code, this is, unac and this is an unacceptable way to do so. Now, there's another quote that I want to invoke. And again, this is perhaps an overused quote, so at the risk of just sounding very uh, boring to you, I'm going to, I'm going to invoke this particular quote. Any fool can write code that a computer can understand. Good programmers write code that humans can understand. Martin Fowler. If this was a religion, I'm a convert and a disciple of this religion. I 100% believe this. That one of the most overlooked things that we have within our craft of software development is that we're not paying attention to how important it is for our code to be readable by humans. And not just humans that have the same tribal knowledge that we have, but any human. Any developer that aspires to understand our code should be able to read it and understand what it's doing. You should explain what the code is doing through the code. All right. There is a principle within HTML. There's a principle called the principle of constituencies. It's within the HTML spec. I would recommend you go Google this. But very briefly, this principle says, where possible, consider the concerns of the user to be greater than the concerns of the author, to be greater than the concerns of, and it goes on to list several other constituencies, including implementers and specification people. But just this first part is actually all we're going to focus on. The principle of constituencies, which, by the way, I think we have completely violated in our modern day web. But that's a whole separate talk, like the one that I was going to give. We've completely violated this, and we've taken the user out of that front spot. And I've, I've been thankful that some of the speakers I've heard echo this same notion, that users are supposed to be at the center of what we do. But I want to repurpose the HTML constituencies principle here to developers. Users greater than authors. Well, who are those users? Let me restate it this way. Perhaps this will make it a little bit clearer, that readers are greater than writers. This is going to challenge some of your notions about what you do as a developer, because you are probably more used to optimizing for your own principled writing, your own processes of writing code. Whatever I can do to make it faster for me to write code, because that's what gets me promotions at work. That's what's incentivized within the industry. And I'd like to suggest to you that you have inverted the principle of constituencies here. Because the more important person you should be thinking about is not yourself, but who has to read your code? And it comes back to this notion of keystrokes, as I've said already. The keystrokes that you spend within your code, you should be thinking not, am I spending the keystrokes to optimize for myself, but am I spending the keystrokes to optimize for who is going to read my code? I may choose to spend more keystrokes, or I may choose to withhold some keystrokes. I'm not simply up here to say that all shortened Forms, all sugar, all syntax, all abstractions are bad? Absolutely not. I'll, I'll address those. But I am saying we need to be a lot more principled at how we make these decisions. Because we oftentimes are guilty, and I am also this way, of focusing too much on the convenience. How convenient is it for me as a developer to get my job done? We reach for all kinds of things to help us with convenience. For example, convention. You've heard that time-honored principle, convention over configuration. It's magically named, and it's magically placed in some directory structure, and that just magically makes it all work together. How awesome. That's super awesome for you, the developer, that is writing that code every single day, every single day, every single day, and it's terrible 
for the developer that comes in without your tribal knowledge. It's absolutely the worst possible way for them to be onboarded to your system than for them at every single turn to say, oh, well, that's another magical incantation that you need to learn. And oh, that's another magical incantation for you to learn. Here's a giant book, go read it, and then you will be immersed within our tribal knowledge and you'll all of a sudden be a great developer. That's the signal that we send. And I have had way too many jobs that that signal was sent to me to not pay attention to that on this part of my career, where my career now is devoted to trying to help people do what they do better. I had way too many times that somebody didn't pay attention to that for me to turn my back now. That's what we need to be focusing on, is making these things not about the convenience, not about simply saying, oh, well, I don't like to write that character, so I'm just gonna remove it from my code because it's easier for me to not write it and it's more beautiful for me to not write it. Whatever your stance is on this, the support that you have for that stance is bullshit. <laughs> because you're not asking the right question. You're not asking, am I making this easier for a person without my tribal knowledge to understand? If you ask that question in a principled and disciplined way, whatever answer you come to, you're gonna get a thumbs up from me. When I ask that question of my code, I leave semicolons in. We've become so drunk on this notion, and I'm very pleased that it was mentioned earlier, actually. I'm gonna echo the things that happened in the beginning keynote. We've become drunk on this notion of easiness. As developers, we reach out to grab that which is easy, that which is within our grasp, and we eschew reaching for simplicity. There is that fantastic talk, as it was mentioned. Simplicity Matters was one of the names of it. Uh, the original name of it was Simple Made Easy. If you have not watched that talk by Rich Hickey, go and watch that talk. I watch it every single month. It should be required watching for every single developer. Expressing this notion that there's a gigantic difference between easy and simple. And that if we go after easy, we often end up with complicated, braided together, difficult to take apart, not modular. But if we go after simple, we can still achieve the goals of easiness. I have to work a little bit harder at it, but we can still achieve the goals of easiness. So perhaps one of the ways for us to fight back against this convenience thing is to fight back against our own instincts to reach for whatever's easy, and instead reach for what's simple, and use that as your guiding principle for how you write your code. <clears throat> All right, so I promise you that there would be a couple of code samples in this talk, so I'd be remiss if I didn't include at least a couple of code samples, but these are simple, stupid one-liners, so don't feel, if your brain's already wiped out from all the great code you've heard today, don't feel too bad. What are some of the transactions that we could talk about within our economy of keystrokes? What are some of the transactions, the trade-offs that we make, the keystrokes that we spend versus the keystrokes that we save? One example, x plus y times z. Now, for those of you that aren't aware, there is a principle at play that is going to tell us exactly how this operation will occur. It's called order of operations. It's in the JavaScript specification. It's in some really good books that have been written on the topic. It's on MDN. You can learn the principle of the order of operations of different operators. Should you? Yes, you should learn no, you should not force the reader of your code to learn. That's my take. When you assume that everybody that reads your code is automatically gonna know that the multiplication has a higher precedence and therefore happens first before the addition, you have optimized for writing and not for reading. You've chosen the wrong path. You have inverted that principle of constituency. Two extra keystrokes that we can spend and make it extremely clear what's gonna happen with this code. Are these unnecessary? Absolutely, and the compiler is going to ignore the fact that we put them in, but guess what? Who cares what the compiler thinks? I care what the reader thinks. I care if they are able to understand without parsing through and without doing lots of backup research to get that tribal knowledge to understand. That's what I care about. Another example. This actually I use all the time in my code. The default operator 
idiom. We use this or operator to give us this backup value. And yes, there's some nuances with falsy values and whatever, but we use this idiom all over the place. And I have used it, I can't even count how many times in my code. But I also have experience with brand new, first time, never developed before developers teaching them. And guess what they think of code like that? Because they don't have that same tribal knowledge. They don't understand what's going on. So it's a barrier to entry to use an idiom like that because it's shorter and it's cooler and it makes me seem more elite. <laughs> I feel good about myself when I use cool, intricate knowledge, trivia of the language. I feel good about myself until I realize what the reader of my code is going to think. How about the ternary operator? Again, something I use all the time versus just a straight up written if else. The ternary operator, again, prioritizes how quickly can I write something over how quickly can somebody understand what they're reading. Now, the ternary all by itself, not such a huge deal, but when you start chaining ternaries together, <laughs> not only do you invoke, and you're laughing because you've all at least done it or seen code that did it, but not only does the ternary operator invite you to learn operator precedence, it also invites you to learn another piece of tribal knowledge. And when I say invite, I'm obviously saying requires you to. Called associativity. There's left associativity and right associativity. And the ternary operator is different from a lot of other operators in that it is right associative. So if you know exactly what I just said, you're in the cult of tribal wisdom that I just talked about, great. But there's a whole bunch of you that are like, associate what? It's harder to read when we rely upon this tribal knowledge. Finally, I'd be remiss if I didn't call this out because I get bashed a lot for my support of JavaScript's coercion system. I'm a big fan of it. I wrote a whole book about why I think coercion is something we ought to be using. But using double equals is not saving a keystroke over triple equals, and using triple equals is not spending a keystroke unless you really know what's happening under the covers. And I bet most of you have not actually had the opportunity to really learn what's happening with coercive equality. Turns out it's a pretty straightforward algorithm. It's pretty easy to read in the JavaScript spec. I know that's shocking to suggest, but you should read the spec. And then you should go read good books that have been written that talk about the spec. And it's not that hard to understand what's happening with double equals versus triple equals. Another example of that same sort of thing, what I'm talking about by saying I want to use coercion. Code like that looks an awful lot like the code we might remember from Java or other languages where we have to do several steps of casting of our code. And there is an actual example of why we might write string with number of x. We might need to convert it first to a number before we stringify it, because the other way around might end up with the undesired result. So can you write code like that? Of course you can. But this is a perfect example of where using the built-in mechanism of JavaScript's coercion can actually not only just save us some keystrokes, but actually reduce complexity of the code because the path of how to convert is not something most readers need to understand. So here now I'm arguing on the other side. Now I'm saying we should use our ability to raise our own understanding of the language. We should use those tools available to us. You see, this is not a hard and fast, you should always write the most verbose code. It's a use the right tool for the right job. So am I really suggesting that we should dumb down our code to the lowest common denominator? And my answer to that is emphatically no. We should not dumb down our code. We should encourage everyone on our teams to always be learning more. If you don't have code review as one of the cultures of your program, start it tomorrow. You need code review. Not because code review is an easy way to pick on people, because code review primarily doesn't benefit the code, it primarily benefits the coder. And we can use code review in a positive way to encourage everyone on the team to learn. So if somebody incorrectly uses the double equals in a way that is unsafe, rather than just simply marking that as a failed code review and pushing it back to them and saying something like, always use triple equals, maybe what you should do is push back and say, Let's read up on whether double equals or triple equals is appropriate here and make the most appropriate decision based upon our knowledge. And then both of you upped your game. Both of you learned. And you used the tools to your advantage. 
So there is a balance here between the choice of what we spend. I'm not saying be miserly and never use a keystroke, nor am I saying use every possible keystroke that you could use. I'm saying be responsible about it. Now, ES6. I mentioned that earlier. ES6 has actually done a fantastic job of adding a bunch of things to the language, like, for example, the dot, dot, dot operator. I had a conversation about this just earlier today. And someone was suggesting, well, this dot, dot, dot operator kind of looks weird. If I don't have the tribal knowledge to what this thing is, it looks weird. And you're absolutely right. Does that mean that we should avoid all of ES6 because it's going to require us to learn it before we use it? No. There's a bunch of fantastic stuff that ES6 gives us. But you need to have the proper context and narrative to why it's important to learn ES6. The proper context and narrative around ES6 is that the design of these features is not to give you new functionality you've never had before, but rather to let you do the same stuff that you were doing before, but in a cleaner, more declarative fashion. If you're not familiar with the notion of imperative versus declarative, imperative tells you how to do something. Declarative says, this is what I want as the end result. And generally speaking, more declarative structures are easier to understand. They're easier to read. They're easier to use if you don't have the tribal knowledge. Because I don't actually need to get into the weeds of how it's done. I just want to see what should be done. Many of the structures, for example, destructuring, one of my favorite ES6 features, is it complicated? Hell yes, it's complicated. Got lots to learn. But it significantly improves the code, the readability and the understandability of the code. So really what I'm getting at is that the narrative around ES6 is to challenge you to always be learning. I wrote a book series called You Don't Know JS, not because I was trying to insult people. I wrote a book series to suggest we have to adopt a constant mindset of learning, constantly upping our game, constantly trying to understand how to use what tools we have to more effectively communicate through code. I've dedicated my entire career to that notion. Right or wrong, win or lose, I'm all in on the bet that more understandable, more readable, or more learnable code will increase what we do as an industry. We'll improve what we do as an industry. So abstractions. Are abstractions absolutely bad? In fact, quite not. Abstractions are fantastic. Abstractions are great. You use libraries and tools. I'm not asking you to reinvent the wheel every time. I'm telling you, learn how that wheel works before you bolt it onto your car. Abstractions are great. But you know what's bad? When those abstractions are completely hidden from you when you have absolutely no idea and you treat it as a black box. Clark's three laws, Arthur C. Clark, the science fiction author, his most famously quoted of his three laws, any sufficiently complex technology, advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Let me repurpose that. Let me be so bold as to declare Getify's law for just a moment. Any sufficiently unlearned technology is indistinguishable from magic. If you choose not to learn it and you still use it in your code, it is no different than you having a black box and simply invoking some magical incantation about it. It just isn't. Every single thing you use is something that you can learn. Am I saying that you get entirely in the weeds and you never be productive? Of course not. I bet there's a bunch of practitioners here that are bristling at the notion, they think that I'm suggesting, you go be an academic and never get your job done. That's completely false. That's not the narrative here. I'm suggesting that your path to being a better practitioner lies along the path to deeper learning. Even though that's not how it seems in the industry, it's not like it seems like we incentivize that, we don't on the surface. But the path to a long sustained career is not to simply churn through every terrible job until you're so sick of it that you move to the next job, it's to find how to thrive where you're at. And deeper learning is a great path to that thriving. So absolutely, they should be used. You know what? Tools are actually a fantastic way to go about this. So that arrow function, remember I was kind of hating on the arrow function for just a moment. What if the arrow function, instead of being a feature of the language, was simply an editor macro that allowed you to type something shorter, but as soon as you put the space after the arrow, it wrote out all the function for you. So you got the best of the both worlds in that sense. You got to write something that was shorter and quicker and worked the way your brain worked. But what was in the code was more readable and more familiar and more understandable to a larger group of people. Tools are a path to solving some of this tension. 
In one of the talks that I listened to earlier, I heard a statement made that essentially, I'm kind of paraphrasing here, but I heard a statement made that changing the name of a function is absolutely positively no justification for a breaking change. And I want to call BS on that. Because I want to suggest to you that when I refactor my code, the most important thing that I'm trying to do when I refactor my code is figure out how to make it more understandable and more readable and more learnable. And I'm constantly learning better about my problem domain. You know why you refactor? Because when you wrote it the first time, you didn't fully understand the problem. And now you understand it a little bit better. So you absolutely should express it better. And if that is as simple or as stupid as changing a variable name so that now it makes more sense, that's absolutely the refactoring that you should do. And you should force your boss to realize the value of that. The total cost of ownership of well-written, understandable, and maintainable code is vastly lower than the fast code that I get out where the variable doesn't make any sense to somebody two weeks from now. You absolutely should refactor for the purposes of learning. And it's totally OK to prioritize better learning over breakage. What about code comments? I hear a lot of different perspectives on code comments. I hear people telling me code comments should never be necessary in your program because you should just simply write the comments as the code. So we don't need code comments. That's nonsense. We need comments. What we need is a better perspective on what comments are about, because comments are an important tool to code readability. But you know what we shouldn't do? We should absolutely never answer the question, what, with a code comment. That's the purpose of the code. So you should never have a line that says, i equals i plus 1, and then a comment above it, or on the end of the line that says, add 1 to i. That's nonsense. <laughs> Can't tell you how many times I've done it, and I've seen other people do it. So never answer the what. That's the purpose of the code. What should you do? You should answer why. Why am I adding one to it? Because one at this point is a magical number. What's the virtue of one here? Why is one being added to it the correct answer? And sometimes, if the code is particularly difficult to explain, or if you just haven't figured it out yet how to explain it, write code that explains how the code works. That's what comments are about. I absolutely endorse comments. Bringing this back. Code is about communication. The keystrokes that we spend are about communication. They're about getting something more for what we spend in our code. Not just that the code works. I know for many of us, myself included, that's a big enough challenge in and of itself. Just simply solving the program. But that's the skill of being a programmer. The art, the lifelong pursuit of being a developer, being an engineer, is to figure out how to make that make sense to somebody else, including your future self. So when we spend those keystrokes, we should be asking that question. Let me say it this way. Make every keystroke, and I'm about to run out of characters here again. Oops. Make every keystroke. And every keystroke saved, oops, <laughs> give myself some more characters to type. Hopefully that's enough. Make every keystroke and every keystroke saved count for real value. The keystrokes you choose and the keystrokes that you withhold should be intentional should not be a hype bandwagon because somebody told you this thing is more readable. You should ask yourself, who's reading my code? Will they understand what I've written? Creating more teachable code is what I'm getting at. You've heard of TDD before, test-driven development. I like to say TDD, teachability-driven development. Can I write code that is more teachable? And I would say that is the way to get more rich in the economy of keystrokes. So thanks very much. I appreciate your time listening. I appreciate that all of you came to this fantastic conference. And I will simply remind any of you that want to reach out and tell me that I'm crazy, 
there's plenty of ways to do so. But thanks very much, and let's go enjoy lots of great drinks at the after party. <laughs>